Welcome everybody to a sneak preview of the 2020 Singapore Literature Festival in NYC. My name is uh, G. Leon Ko, and I'm the founder and organizer of Singapore Unbound, and I'm your host tonight. I'm wearing a white shirt and sitting in my home office with a shelf of books behind me. My preferred pronouns are he and him. Organized by the New York City-based literary nonprofit Singapore Unbound, the Singapore Literature Festival brings together Singaporean and American authors and audiences for readings and discussions. Appropriately, the festival theme this year is The Politics of Hope. We want to acknowledge gratefully the sponsorship of Ethos Books and many private individual champions as well as the support of our co-presenters, New Narrative, The Evergreen Review, Asia Society, Adelphi, University at, and, sorry, Adelphi University's MFA program and soapbox series, NYU's English Department's Post-Colonial Race and Diaspora Studies Colloquium, the Southeast Asian Studies program at the University of California, Riverside, and Books Actually. Tonight, as a preview of the festival, we have the pleasure of hearing from three comics artists from Singapore about working on political and social topics in an authoritarian state. Our co-presenter for this event is New Narrative. More than just a platform for long form journalism, New Narrative is a movement for democracy, freedom of expression and freedom of information in Southeast Asia. But first, let me introduce you to our event moderator, Deborah Germain Augustine. Hello, everyone. I'm Deborah Augustine. My pronouns are she, her. I'm joining you from my home in Kuala Lumpur. Um, I am wearing a colorful shirt and you see a shelf of books and odds and ends behind me. I'm the membership engagement manager and Malaysia lead at New Narrative, a movement for democracy, freedom of expression and freedom of information in Southeast Asia. We publish long form journalism, research podcasts and comics by and for Southeast Asians. Sonny Liu who's on the panel is actually one of our founders and we've had the pleasure of publishing all three of today's panelists work. We have in my opinion, an impressive archive of contemporary Southeast Asian comics on political education and life in Southeast Asia. I had planned a different introdu introduction for today, but the events of this week have changed that. We're one of the few alternative media sources in Singapore where mainstream media is connected to the ruling PAP government. I don't have to tell Singaporeans what that means, but for those outside of the region, here's some context. On September 18, the Elections Department in Singapore filed a police report against us, alleging that some of our Facebook posts about the recent Singapore election amounted to illegal election activity because we boosted them or paid for them to have a wider audience. As a result, our founder and managing director PJ Thumb was questioned by the police for four and a half hours on Monday and had his phone and laptop seized. PJ is home safe and we've received a lot of support, which we're very grateful for. So it feels fitting that I'm moderating this panel today because the threats to political commentary in Singapore are real and this is what we're here to talk about. So I'm really excited for this panel. Um, just a little plug, it costs 52 US dollars to join as a member and join the movement. And today, for those of you tuning in, we have a coupon. So if you use NN Solidarity at checkout, you get a 25% discount on an annual membership. This is only valid for 24 hours, so you have to snap it up. Um, if you can't afford a membership right now, we also have a free weekly newsletter that you can sign up for at bit.ly slash nnweekly. And if you're an academic, we also offer institutional memberships for 500 US dollars. And you can email me at deborah.augustin at newnarrative.com to find out more about that. Thank you. Um, Deborah, would you introduce the uh, speakers for the panel? Um, so today we have Sonny Liu, um, we have Shirin Rafi, and we have Joy Ho. Um, as I mentioned, Sonny Liu is a founder of New Narrative, 
And he's also the Eisner Award winning comics artist who's written um, the um, a, a comic book, <laughs> gosh, the name escapes me right now. Um, the um, <laughs> sorry, the art Jean, of Charlie Chan. Could you, could you, the uh, art yes, of the art and of Charlie Chan. I've actually written about it, so it's so funny that I've just blanked about it right now. <laughs> no worries, that happens to all of us. Yeah. Uh, most recently, uh, at New Narrative, Shirin Rafi has published a great political explainer about elections and voter secrecy. Um, and Joy Ho, also an amazing illustrator and artist, has also done um, an illustration, a beautiful illustration for us on queer activism in Singapore, specifically um, the evolution of Pink Dot. So that's a little bit of how their work has been connected with New Narrative and they're all three um, amazing artists and have contributed really important work to um, political comics and illustration in the region. Right, thank you so much, Deborah, uh, for explaining their connection to new narrative. And uh, everyone who's actually watching this uh, show, if you look at the chat box, you can actually find fuller uh, biographical notes of the uh, speakers for today. And I believe, Deborah, we are actually beginning with uh, Sunny first, aren't we? Followed by Joy and then Shirin. Yes, that's right. So we're starting with Sonny, Joy, and um, Shirin. All right, Sonny, uh, over to you. Uh, before I leave, I'm going to ask everybody uh, speaking to speak slowly and clearly so that our closed captioner can actually uh, try to record what you're saying. Uh, there is closed caption, so uh, please avail yourself of it if you should need it. All right, over to you, Sonny. Hello, hi, Chi, hi, everyone. Um, I'm very glad to be here to talk to everyone here. Uh, are the slides showing right now? I can't quite tell on the screen. They are showing, right? Yep. Okay. So, um, yeah. I guess I guess I want to talk a little bit about the the reasons for and against uh, doing the things that we do, like I, which is, uh, I would guess, drawing and making uh, controversial co comics or cartoons or illustrations. Um, and for me, you know, the book, uh, Charlie Chanok Chai, uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please, oh, sorry. Uh, it was on the surface, a book that was about a, a cartoonist called Charlie Chan. So there were interviews of him, uh, next slide. Uh, as well as samples of his work, um, liner notes, uh, next slide. Um, more samples of his work, so next slide as well. And one more next slide. Uh, but when you read the book um, more carefully, you, I think you will realize that it's actually about a Singapore's history. Uh, it was essentially a critique of the mainstream national narrative that we have here in Singapore. Well, I mean, every country has its own, but uh, in Singapore particularly, it's been uh, very controlled by the ruling party. And if you'd asked me why I did this book, I would have said uh, then and now that the idea, idea of it uh, felt very engaging and comp compelling to me, right? It was just very interesting. The idea that I could tell a, a story about Singapore's history through a different angle, uh, that the book itself had some formal properties that I thought were interesting in a narrative sense. Um, and the next slide. And this was, you know, essentially similar to the feelings I had when I did my first comic when I was 19, right? So. Uh, when I first started out doing my comics, um, it was also a very political comic called Frankie and Pooh that was published in the new paper at the time. And, uh, you know, the same reasons for doing it, like I, I felt like I had ideas I wanted to share with uh, readers. Uh, I felt like I had interesting um, ideas that I wanted to put on paper. And that I think is on a personal level, uh, the reasons why I got into comics and cartooning. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and in between the, those two things, right, in between drawing for the new paper and doing the Art of Charlie Chan, I spent several years working on so-called more personal projects, uh, like Wonderland here, was written by Tommy Kovac, um, published by Disney Press. Next slide. 
uh, and I also did a series called Maniki Robot. Um, <clears throat> sorry. <coughs> uh, next slide, please. Which was a about a uh, two street urchins living in the mm, near future dystopia, and, and this was a, a lot less political in nature, uh, a lot more about just everyday living in a sci-fi city. Next slide, please. Uh, and also, My Fifth and Frankie, which is written by Mark Campbell, uh, drawn by myself, and sorry, written by Mike Carey, and written by myself and Mark Campbell. And uh, these projects, I think, um, they were also interesting in their own way, uh, in the sense that they, you know, for example, uh, My Fifth and Frankie was published by DC Vertigo, and as a big fan of Sandman and uh, the whole imprint, this was very exciting for me to work on. But I think books like this, um, they're never quite as engaging as writing and drawing your own stories, uh, just because the ideas expressed are usually the, the ones um, from the writer, right? So as, as an illustrator, you're just trying to express those things, express the story uh, as best as you can, rather than engaging with your own ideas, um, which is why I've continued to draw my own comics like the next slide. Sorry, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, things like this, right? This is like a caricature of uh, Najib along with uh, Jamal Yunus. And a lot of these pol cartoons that I continue to do these days, uh, I post on Facebook or social media, and most of them are <clears throat> done pro bono. I, I don't do it for any particular uh, platform. I just publish it. And sometimes it gets republished in other platforms, but they're essentially personal cartoons that uh, I feel uh, interesting to do. Yeah, at some level, it's an interesting practice for me technically. And next slide, please. Uh, I mean, at some level, of course, I do hope that you know something go viral or get seen by more people. But uh, even if they don't, I would still probably draw them just for my own uh, self-expression, as you call it. Next slide. Um, so this one is of uh, Calvin Chang. Uh, People in Singapore will know, but most people outside probably won't. Um, so yeah, I think I think in that sense, that's my own personal reason for doing comics of this kind. Uh, it's essentially the idea that I I feel like I have ideas I want to express, I want to share with people. All right, next slide. And on the flip side, I think there are forces that compel us not to draw comics of this kind. Um, and myself and Charon George, an academic who's now based in Hong Kong, I've been working on a book called Red Lines uh, for the past year or so. And uh, Charon has gone around interviewing a lot of cartoonists around the world and getting their uh, stories, right? Uh, about different kinds of repression and censorship that they have faced. Uh, some are, of course, very extreme in the sense of like uh, arrest, executions, torture. Uh, and some on the other end are much more calibrated, right? So it's more financial incentives. And there is one chapter in the book uh, called Gilded Cages where both Singapore and Iran are featured. And that's not to say that Singapore and Iran are the same because I think Iran is obviously a lot more hardline in its uh, control. But um, there is an interesting organization in Iran called the House of Khatun, which is a official body that uh, cartoonists in Iran can take part in, right? They can take part in contests, exhibitions, and uh, we spoke to, sorry, next slide, please. And artist called Kenush, who is an exile in France uh, from Iran. And he talks about how this body allows people, cartoonists to attack anything, right? You're free to talk about Israel, imperialism, anything, but you can't criticize the Iranian government and you can't criticize the Iranian mullahs. So those, those are, in his words, untouchable. Uh, next slide, please. Right, and the consequence of this is that, uh, according to him, the new generations of cartoonists in Iran no longer recognize the value of cartoons in a journalistic or editorial sense. So they see their job, uh, in his words, as participating in uh, competitions, right? They become professional contest participants. And uh, I think this financial incentive, right? The idea that you could not rock the boat and have a career in comics in Iran is a quite powerful force, right? And in Singapore, I think it's similar. Next slide. 
um, in the sense, oh, I can skip this one. Next slide, please. Uh, in the sense that I think <clears throat> in Singapore, for example, um, arts funding is, I believe, 80 to 90% funded by the state. So if you're a creator of in any medium, whether it's theater, comics, uh, writing, there is a strong incentive uh, not to rock the boat if you want to get uh, the grants you need to do your work or take part in projects. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, sorry, these this pages are from actually uh, the same book, Red Lines, where I talk about my experiences. Um, and if you look at the final three panels on the last, on the bottom, uh, I talk about how in Singapore, there's this added um, level of self-censorship in the sense that uh, the, the financial incentives and disincentives are very seldom stated explicitly, right? So you are, you're aware that they exist and sometimes you sense that they are there, but the, when, when, let's say a grant is turned down, for example, you're never told that um, it's because of your political views. It's because uh, there was fierce competition for grants and your, your application just didn't make it. So you are, uh, if you, if you were to claim that it, it was because of censorship, then you are uh, in a way speculating, right? And I think that creates a sense that, uh, that it's never about politi politics, that they can claim it's about merit. And that makes it doubly hard for you to take a position claiming that it is censorship uh, in the tradi traditional sense. Next slide, please. Um, but, you know, despite all that, I still continue to draw comics or cut illustrations like this one uh, of uh, Ho Ching. And the next one, which is a comic I did about the recent elections. Um, and I think those are the two things which I feel in Singapore have been, for me personally, most com uh, created tensions, right? So on, one, on the one hand, I have this personal uh, desire, maybe it's a human desire, you could call it, right? To express myself, to communicate, to tell stories. And on the other hand, there are these financial pressures that exist that, um, you know, t tell you that if you want to have a good career here in, as an artist, as a cartoonist, as a practitioner of arts, that it's safer and it's better to toe the line, right? To do what the state uh, would prefer you to do. And I think those are for me the two forces that I often grapple with here. Thank you. Hi. I'm currently unmuted. Am I going next? All right, is the PDF on? I can't see it on my screen. Ah, yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. I am Joy. Uh, I go by she, they pronouns. Um, I am currently in Singapore with my bookshelf behind me. And, uh, well, not my bookshelf, I'm somewhere else. But anyways, um, I'm wearing a blue jacket and I have a white shirt. And uh, on the slides are just my uh, details and um, just a picture of me and some of my scratchy dogs I draw for comics. All right, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, I'll be presenting, I guess, on uh, the stuff I did for New Narrative first. Um, I have not made a comic for New Narrative, but hopefully I will soon. Um, but this is, a, this is an illustration I created for um, a pink dot piece by Kirsten, Kirsten Han, who runs, uh, who's a wonderful activist and very intelligent. And I was very pleased to be working on this piece, um, which tracks the history of Pink Dot as a movement and um, how it originated from being a picnic to kind of, or like rather, I mean, it was always a movement, but then they kind of used the, the uh, like a kind of picnic setting to, to ease in, to ease in kind of the more strong political aspects of being queer and accepted in Singapore. Uh, so next slide, please. So these are the articles that it's accompanying um, growing a movement activist, activism of uh, Singapore, which uh, kind of really talks about um, like what the kind of uh, hoops it needed to kind of go over so that the illustration kind of depicts um, 
to like people kind of coming together to hold these this flower which uh, has the pink dot face there and it's kind of representing that it's a very community built um, event and it's and it's created by the people who um, who make up the community in Singapore. Uh, and it also, it, you might kind of notice that it looks a little bit like when the when the pink dot is lit up in Honglim Square. Um, so it's kind of like the top down view just to, and showing like this kind of blooming of a, of a, this growing of a, this movement. Yeah. And then the secondary uh, piece, which is, because this is a two part, a uh, two-part article um, talking about the limits of Singapore activism, which is kind of, uh, if I believe what Kirsten was trying to uh, kind of uh, interrogate was um, how how far can movements like this go and when, you know, does something become a quote unquote mm, legal gathering of people to <laughs> talk about something they care about. But, uh, but yeah, so this is kind of, um, this depiction is just kind of showing the fence where there is a places, a room for, room for flowers and room for um, the things you care about to grow and flourish, uh, but you know, also being very cognizant of uh, where limits are and um, about what we should kind of navigate in a very specific circumstance like in Singapore. Yeah, so next slide please. Uh, yeah, so this is, I'm just going to probably just run through a few of these like kind of illustrative stuff that I've done for um, maybe things in line with uh, what we're talking about. Um, so I, this is just a, a newsletter by Kirsten that I just wanted to shout out that I helped to uh, do this um, little profile picture for this header. Uh, and I, I think it, it was a really good opportunity because now I, I find that artists sometimes um, we, we kind of know where we stand ideologically but maybe we don't have like um, necessarily the the natural bandwidth or like the kind of uh how do you say it? kind of like growing up and have like not necessarily having all the resources that Singapore maybe should have given us um, I think one way to do it is to support local activism you know using our as designers just like speaking to all the designers out there like to kind of use whatever you can to um, support uh, people in the capacity that you're most capable of. And I think that's where uh, power can be kind of distributed within like just support and, uh, and, and spreading the word. Yeah, uh, next slide please. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to show off also just like this commercial work that I did for the National Museum. So I do also have kind of like the, I work as a, a freelance illustrator. So, um, uh, and I'm also currently having an office job now. Uh, but I think a lot of the, the stuff I do is kind of reaching a good ratio of what I, I think is important to have in Singapore and the commercial work I do. Um, and also even with the commercial work, I think a lot of my priorities are also um, within the realm of illustration, like what, what other things can I push? Um, I, I try to feature like unconventional family structures whenever I'm drawing something for like a a big client, which is just like the reality of how things are um, representing people of different accessibility needs uh, and down to the most basic thing of like when you look around like how you, you don't only see pale faced illustrated characters walking around there's people of all different shades and it's crazy how um, sometimes uh, you don't even see that in the basic amount of illustrative work that you see all around Singapore. Yeah, so I think I think little little moments like this is already what uh, designers can do to push forward uh, the reality that you want to live in. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, so this is also something that I worked on with uh, my good friend Worms um, and, a, and a rotating team for Queer Zine Fest. Uh, we organized this and I, I was actually brought on as just a designer. So um, on this screen is just a poster of Queer Zine Fest on the left. It the first one happened in 2018. The right one is just a cute little uh, Kickstarter t-shirt we made. So I came on as a designer and it was supposed to be a very, I'm just going to draw and support kind of the way I know how, but then in the end I ended up being one of the primary organizers uh, with them. Uh, so this is this is our, our pride and joy. I think we, uh, we created I want to say I think we create a little community of people who come together and our age groups are almost like around my age and below so there's a lot of younger people coming to our event we try to make it as family friendly as possible uh kind of just showing acceptance and kind of keep diversifying like what uh the the full spectrum of any individual who wants to come by the fest uh, can be yeah 
So this is entirely, entirely crowdfunded as well, completely independent. Um, yeah, so next slide, please. Uh, this is just some nice images of the festival that happened in 2018. A lot of wonderful people. Um, so if you're someone who belongs to this community or wants to support, feel free to follow us on Instagram. Uh, we are we wanted to do one this year, but obviously for the circumstances, uh, it had to be pushed. But um, we do do a lot of uh, fringe events. So we do kind of like scene making workshops and it's kind of these uh, people who come in, they use magazines, they use comics, they use any kind of printed media material because uh, these are good ways for people to um, express, have some vehicle of expression. And then also they are relatively anonymous if you don't tag yourself. So in a way it's like, um, there's also some safety in terms of this kind of thing versus let's say social media uh, nowadays. It, it's pretty popular with like expression, but then, you know, scenes can't really be quote unquote track because there's this whole idea of, um, I, it comes from the origins of like chapbooks and political uh, uh, writing in places of suppression because they can't be kind of followed if you don't write any credits. But yeah, so if you go to the next slide, um, this is just uh, something we did during the pandemic. So we, we do, we, we kind of, I think, place a lot of importance both on the queerness of Queer Zine Fest and the zineness of, of the Zine Fest. Uh, and during the, uh, the pandemic, our priority was really uh, kind of reaching, reaching out to the community that we're involved with and making sure that everyone was um, looked up after because um, families can sometimes be um, uh, not the most accepting places and we wanted people to have an outlet. So every, every time it was like eight o'clock at night, uh, we would have the pajama party and people would come on and uh, take it on for an hour and then we have people tune in. And uh, when there were salient things that was happening that people maybe wanted some bouncing off point from they could tune in and then like for example um during during the i think uh more like public conversations about race we we would talk about those during like the height of the season or but it also went down to just like daily life and COVID. how is it like or like music um just to just show solidarity and show that we're here yeah next slide please uh, yeah, and then this is just the last project that I wanted to share. This was also this also came out during um, the pandemic's um, situation, especially with the big humanitarian crisis that was um, the uh, the migrant workers not having the kind of care they needed, and it was long long overdue. Uh, so um, this is this is a comic I made for our pandemic, a group collaborative effort that has. Uh, four other illustrators alongside me, um, creating comics, uh, um, creating comics that were based off on of, like uh, entirely lifted from um, uh, poor, the poetry groups in the migrant worker circle. Yeah. So, um, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is just a website you can visit migrantstories.online to hear the poets uh, recite poetry for this um, and. And uh, you can read the comics and it's kind of supposed to show, you know, the artistry that really binds us together is the commonality. Uh, and so you can kind of see a variety of like direct depictions of um, the, the context that they're in or versus like transposing their poems on the lived reality of also the Singaporeans undergoing their own struggles. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so these are just some of the artists I wanted to feature uh, who are good friends of mine. Um, and I think hopefully we will do another series soon um, because I think now the, the conversation has kind of moved from uh, the lockdown to also a lot of the mental health um, struggles that a lot of them are facing now because uh, the adrenaline of, of, uh, of help has kind of like subsided and a lot of it is now a lot of worry on taking care of their families and the job security uh, and still generally being in a state of uh, scrutiny and lockdown. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the, just the panel that we also had in conjunction with the comics. So we planned this um, after we launched all the comics. So a lot of people joined in, both um, people from the migrant community and the local community. Um, and we got to listen to them recite their poetry and we had a panel listening to what they had to say. 
so yeah, this is uh, this is where we're at. A lot of so so this group of people I worked with, uh, um, a lot of them are in social work, and a lot of them are also in narrative building. So we all came together to kind of uh, collaborate with everybody. Yeah, so that's where we are. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so my name is Shirin Rafi and I'm also known as Straw Monster Jar. Uh, I'm wearing a green shirt, I'm at home, uh, I'm sitting in my room in Singapore and like behind me is my cat, Kimchi, who's half awake. Um, my preferred pronouns are she and her. So um, just a quick briefing about what I do. Um, basically, I most of my works are always about like tabletop games, like geeky stuff, uh, doing prints for digital media. Um, my style is pretty, I would say, um, usually very bright and optimistic. I like to work with a lot of colorful scenes. Um, so, so on the right side, you know, top right side, you can see like you know, book cover illustrations. Underneath is um, actually a tabletop game I worked with called. Bird's Nest, and it's actually a game commissioned by a friend who enjoys bird watching and wanted to make a fun game about birds in Singapore and the effects of human activities on nature. So, um, you know, on the left side, you can see um, some of the rarer birds you might find in Singapore. And on the right side, um, uh, examples of human activities that occur in Singapore. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the other thing I'm doing is that I co-founded an enterprise called Wild Dot. Um, it's basically a new venture making botanical watercolors using plants and horticultural waste in Singapore. So the things I do right now is like you know trying to uh, make my own paintbrushes, uh, search for earth pigments that can be found in um, Singapore soil. Um, and also seeing what are the kind of horticultural waste we produce in Singapore and how can I make this into paint and you know use it for my own purposes or like you know sell it to other people, uh, things like that. Uh, we hope to use um, this as a medium for people to know more about the regional nature in Southeast Asia. And yeah, uh, if you're interested in seeing more what we do, you can just follow us in the Instagram link, uh, which is wild.sg. Uh, next slide. So um, I was approached by the new narrative to work on a series of explainers for the recent uh, general election. Um, one of it being new narrative explains the Singapore elections and the other, the importance of polling and counting agents. Um, I would say it was, uh, it's, it's one of the first co political comics I had to work on, to be honest. And I was just like, oh, okay, maybe, you know, this is something I can play a part in and get other people to understand, um, you know, what happens during the elections and the different roles that happen or the different um, issues that occur during, um, you know, all the, you know, from the run up to the elections itself. So. Um, it was it was also a good way for me to like you know understand better the whole process of this like um, polling day and stuff like that. Uh, um, yeah, next slide. So so this is like um, and and explains the Singapore elections. Uh, so it's written by Kirsten as well. Uh, so on the left and right is pretty much my um, you know the the final piece and the processes, like the sketch I work with. So I try to keep it simple, approachable and lighthearted uh, because, um, you know, you want to make this approachable and friendly to people. You don't want to like turn them off with like too much text and stuff like that because people tend to think, uh, um, you know, politics can be kind of sophisticated. So I'm trying to bring it, trying to make this like more down to earth for people. Um, so like you can see um, what I do with my drafting is that I try to do some simple color blocking and um, 
simple, like, you know, a few colored blocks to make sure that it's polished. Um, next slide. Um, okay, so one of my favorite examples in this comic is called the Quay Lapis Demography. Um, I tried to make um, racial categories seem a lot more um, approachable by I'm sorry, there's like a renovation going on on top of me. Um, yeah, I tried to make uh, racial categories more approachable and understandable by uh, having, um, by displaying it in the Kwe Lapis. Um, so, you know, everyone, or most Singaporeans know that the Kwe Lapis is, you know, a tasty treat, not only a tasty treat, but it's also divided into various colors. But, you know, if we had to, Put this across in a Singapore context, then you know this quay lapis is going to be very skewed. Where you know, obviously, the biggest color slice of pieces would be the Chinese, and then you know, Malay, Indian, and then others. Um, okay, next slide. So, um, another way of making uh, issues understandable is also like you know. Uh, as title, making bread and butter tasty for all. Um, there were there were certainly some portions of the script that I found tricky to navigate, uh, especially when it talks about things that are like considered uh, criticized or like carry you know critical things, criticizing things that are carried out by the government. Um, so how do I put that across? Is that you know I try to once again present the facts as they are, be very objective, and um, you know make it at the same time, make it relatable. So uh, it's also pretty similar to the Quay Lapis concept where you know, most of us know the idea of the bread and butter issues um, or the whole terminology of it. And so like, uh, it became a question of how do I break this down? And straight away uh, for me as a Singaporean, I'm like, oh, it's like something out of a kopitiam or coffee shop scene where people are usually talking about issues that they um, have on their minds. So, um, so in that sense, I tried to display like, you know, there's this entity that is spreading bread for you as the viewer. And then that would be sort of the issue. And then um, this entity would be like, yeah, I'm going to spread butter as a resolution to solve it for you. So you can sort of see how, how it plays out politically, like where the entity is just like, oh yeah, I have this whole, um, you know, like who's gonna spread this butter for you pretty much? And then, you know, holding the whole like loaf of bread and like, look at all these issues, only I can spread it. Or, you know, it, it gives that sort of impression of, um, which makes the person think twice. On the right visual, um, the visual on the right, you can sort of see like, um, I also try to break down the complexity of a situation to be more understandable. Like why certain processes in the polling period um, can be considered unfair. Um, so, you know, it also became a, a way for me to try to, to take the script apart piece by piece so that, um, you know, even I myself can understand it as well as like, you know, this is something I put it across to uh, friends close to me and ask them like, hey, if you read this, can you understand it? Like, does it uh, play across to you, um, um, you know, nice and simple? Um, so, you know, yeah, it talks about how like candidates are, each candidate is given three minutes of uh, television time. Um, it sounds fair, like, you know, in a text, but, you know, when you put it out visually, like, you can sort of see, oh, yeah, you know, there's a bigger party involved. Um, those with a bigger party uh, has a bigger benefit from this outcome. Um, yeah, next slide. Uh, so, how I tried to put across um, this whole, uh, uh, you know, while well, drawing the comic is that I tried to, you know, put across a very, uh, like, you know, a neutral voice, especially like, um, you know, we know the nature of the article, it's meant to be an explainer. Um, once again, I have to reiterate to keep an objective outlook to the visuals when you put it as, aside, you know, alongside the content. Um, especially when the script sometimes can uh, talk about conflict. 
like conflict always happens, you know, it's, it's natural in politics, especially. Um, and, but the thing is, you don't want to be in a situation where uh, visuals create an impression that you're leaning towards bias, especially, you know, when you know the political scene is very um, sensitive. Um, so, you know, that's why for this whole project, it's called like Explainer. So it's like uh, intended to be factually informative to the public. Um, so in this scene, you can sort of see like how rules can accidentally be breached or mistakes can happen. Like, you know, this, this normal, um, no one is perfect. We all like know that. Uh, but for me, like um, when I'm tackling um, visuals like this, uh, it's quite important to know like how to keep a neutral body language of your characters. Um, obviously you can like put angry people like, uh, hell mobbing about like you know oh you did this wrong you did that wrong it's like no way <laughs> it's gonna be like too it's obviously gonna be very biased on my end and it also create a bias of the writer like you know people have a very bad impression of it at some level so yeah um it's just because um you know you want to keep an open conversation you want it to be more constructive so um neutral body language and be like hey something is wrong but and I would like to talk about it or, um, you know, I, I'd like to point it out that, you know, this is not okay or things like that, you know, just making things less angry. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think that's about it. Yeah. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, Okay, um, thank you all three of you. Um, that was really interesting. And I love seeing all the variety of styles there. So we've already got a few questions. I think the first one I'll start with is, um, and it's a general question to all three of you, what are some of the things that influenced or even shaped your political consciousness and therefore the your political art. So Sonny, you mentioned like the early cartoons that you were drawing were political in nature too. And Chirin, um, you said that this comic that you did for New Narrative, The Explainer was uh, probably the first kind of more political work. So yeah, I think if all three of you could maybe, um, maybe uh, uh, Shirin, would you, uh, since you just spoke, like maybe we'll start with Sonny, like what, what shaped your political consciousness and, and hasn't had an influence on your political art? Um, well, I mean, I think like everybody, I mean, influences that affect you come from a lot of different directions. Um, but just in terms of Singapore's history, or in the Singapore context, I would say that coming across a book called uh, No Man is an Island by an author called James Minchin was for me personally, the, the sort of the path that um, introduced me to alternative narratives about Singapore because um, that book was a, essentially a critical biography of Lee Kuan Yew and having grown up here for most of my life um, and encountered um, you know mostly very positive glowing uh, accounts of uh, the, our former prime minister uh, that book was a bit of a eye-opener right so it, it showed a different side of Lee Kuan Yew it, it told a history of um, his behavior or his uh, personality that I hadn't quite seen before. And I think that probably started me on the path to being aware that there were alternative revisionists, whatever you want to call it, accounts of um, our national history and our national narrative. Thank you. Um, Joy, would you like to jump in here? Uh, yeah, so I, I think uh, being... Um, literally part of a community that needs to advocate for itself, I think is already a big factor. Um, and I think maybe even for communities like outside of our immediate circle, uh, definitely at least for our, the, um, the project or pandemic was definitely, I think a lot of some of these kind of stems from a helplessness from not being able to do anything um, or rather at least like finding an outlet to maybe even uh, undergo um, kind of a, an emotional, you know, core, core necessity to figure out like why is something that I was brought up with and these biases or um, uh, things that were kind of like 
so normalized and why why does why did it seem so normalized that people were being treated this way in Singapore um, and unpacking that and I think like because during the the crisis for the migrant workers a lot of it was uh, very factual we, I mean there was a lot of charity work that was coming which was great because I was part of an earlier team also which was helping to disseminate graphics uh, but the comics aspect kind of helped to uh, bridge a bit more of the emotional divide of um, kind of uh, like r radical empathy almost because sometimes you realize that some of these biases are all the way at the back of our heads and I think storytelling does kind of uh, let you uh, put these things together a bit better within like the entirety of your being so that when you actually jump into causes you kind of brain knows you care about but then like when your heart really knows it then I think then you can really be stronger and and you you would start putting in a priority also yeah Awesome. Um, I like that brain heart connection. Um, Shirin, what about you? Um, uh, it was quite interesting because like, um, for me growing up, I did, um, you know, I went through the whole school system and did all this like, um, you call it like, H1, H2 art, that kind of thing, like take all the art classes that are in um, public schools. Um, and I think the first thing that actually stood out to me was that I had to sign a form that said like, you know, oh, um, my final year art project can't be anything political and stuff like that. So I was just like, oh, something's kind of weird. Like, why can't we, why can't we do like, you know, obviously not straight up offensive art, but why can't we have a conversation in the first place? And, um, you know, afterwards I went into university, went through school, um, actually met Sunny as my teacher at some point. Um, so yeah, it, it opened up, it, it brought on my perspective on like, you know, what, um, why can't we have a conversation about things at time? Like you don't have to straight up like, um, you know, no one likes to, have conflict. Obviously, no one likes to have conflicts. Uh, it's just like more of like people have this fear of um, approaching each other, having this conversation first. Like everyone just want to like you know point fingers and oh angry, angry on the internet that kind of thing. It's just like um, I feel like we have to be able to approach each other in a more like um, mutual understanding. Like yeah, like let's talk about things. Uh, so yeah, so this is pretty much how. I went through my life as an artist growing up, yeah. Yeah, I think something that struck me, Shirin, about what you said during your presentation is how um, you tried to to have, you know, your, you, you consider your style very bright, optimistic, and um, you wanted to bring that into the explainer to sort of make it more approachable, um, which is a good segue into the next question is, how are political cartoons a more effective or not medium than long form commentaries, um, especially in a politically sensitive space like Singapore? And how does the medium also negative, uh, navigate censorship and laws like POFMA? And for those outside of Singapore, POFMA is the prevention of all online falsehoods, manipulation and manipulation act. So it's sort of the quote unquote fake news law in Singapore. And, and I think Shirin, you were kind of trying to navigate that a little bit in your, um, in your work for New Narrative when, when approaching some of the more sensitive parts of the script. Uh, yeah, um, so when, um, because for this, for the project, one of the writers is actually uh, PG Tum himself, and a lot of the writing was definitely checked through, like, you know, oh, we make, sure they really, uh, what, the new narrative people are very thorough in checking that uh, where their facts are coming from, it's not just unfounded claims. Um, so it was equally important on my end to make sure that, um, I'm not trying to paint an extra picture into this narrative that can be very like, you know, um, it becomes an issue for both parties, like for me as the artist and for a new er narrative as well. So um, I, yeah, so for me, it's like, um, you know, of course, like making things bright and optimistic helps um, not to say disarm the situation, it just um, makes it more approachable. Like people don't wanna just run away from like 
scary looking graphics and stuff like that. So it's just people can like ease themselves in and be like, um, yeah, so these are all the information that, uh, you know, that, that exists on the internet. You can probably find it if you search for it. Um, and um, the job on my end is like, how do I make it more understandable? Because sometimes text can be like, you know, wall of text and everyone is just like, oh, I can't read through all of this. Like, can you give me something simpler these days? Yeah, so, um, I mean, especially like, you know, social media, how like, you know, we love like flipping through things really fast. So it's, um, I guess it was important to, for me to make it small bite size and easy to understand. Yeah. Great. Um, Sonny, I don't know if you wanted to add something about, um, yeah, because you have had some experience as well in terms of um, having to navigate maybe less traditional censorship, but still um, you had a grant taken away um, for Charlie Chan Hock Chai. And yeah, how do, how do you feel about comics as a political, like as an effective medium of political communication and, and how do you navigate censorship? Um, you know, I, I think visuals as a way to communicate has been, you know, a long tradition in, in human history, right? I mean, uh, you look at all the paintings of religious iconography and uh, in the museums, they, they were primarily as a way to communicate to people who couldn't read the Bible back in the day. So I think, uh, you know, whether it's visual or visual with text, that's been a, a long history of, of being a very effective uh, way to communicate ideas yeah, to, 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 pe to people who might not want to read as hearing say a wall of text. Um, but I think there's also a particular um, history of comics that makes it in a way more accessible. Uh, this is in the sense that just the, the way that history has uh, comics has developed, uh, it's often seen as a juvenile medium that appears in newspaper comic strips or uh, as superhero comics, uh, that, that genre. So I think when people, you know, despite the fact that this is the so-called golden age of comics where comics have grown up, you know, since the 80s, uh, there are a lot of people who still think of comics as being material for kids or in, in, at least in their own minds, right? So when you see a comic, they tend to be, uh, tend to approach it um, with the guards down a little bit, I think, right? They, they, they don't anticipate reading something serious, uh, even though it can be. And I think that actually gives us a way to um, get readers to engage with the material a little bit easier. So I think I think it does come under the radar a little bit, both in terms of the reader's perception, but also maybe you know to some extent uh, media censorship. Right? I think governments, uh, for most part, might not be as uh, cognizant of uh, cartoons versus you know uh, videos and things that appear on in article form. Joy, um, what it, what has you been your experience in in navigating censorship and um, yeah, and how do you feel about comics as a political form? Uh, I think my stuff is definitely a bit more social rather than political so far. So I think there's a little bit uh, of of getting into that direction. But I think that that kind of brings about, I guess, also why why are some things. Uh, political with the capital P as well. Like has there been so much of like the fear generated uh, from the powers that be that like politics is such a such a scary place to wander into. Um, and and jumping off of like what Shirin said about like making comics bright and like less scary. I think there's this thing like people ask me like, oh like is this okay that you're posting this? And it's like the famous thing. I'm just like this is literally about human rights. Like why is this an issue? Uh, so I think it's kind of just lessening that idea of fear um, and like I, I think that's also like something I learned from like QZF as well. We it's uh it's something we just kind of like jumped into for the festival. Um and, and I remember having the postcards for it out and like someone I think uh from Malaysia was like, oh my god, you can do this in Singapore, like that's insane. So I think there's already like different levels of um our, our boundaries and what we can push. And I think like the more people make this less of a terrain that's so uh, taboo or uncharacteristic of the average Singaporean, right? Then it's going to be a lot easier to say, or like if, if let's say some uh, touch wood, like some pofma nonsense happens, and then it would just be like, oh yeah, no, this is just a story. This is just an opinion. Like I I'm not trying to say that this is a fact, but the fact is that the, the world is like composited of stories, and um, a 
lot of these policies maybe only take the most loud stories into account rather than the underheard stories. So um, I, I think the idea is just to kind of like bring all of bring all of these uh, concerns and, and stories from everyone who, who lives here to just kind of actually effect change that um, impacts real people in their real lives. Yeah, hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, I have a couple uh, te more technical questions um, about th the form of comics and illustrations themselves. I'm going to try and, and, and uh, combine them. Um, how, um, so one one question I have from Weishin is, um, how do you feel um, about the ability to represent time or temporality in graphics space but has it been useful in your comics about society and politics? So um, this question is about how, you know, um, comics allows transient and intangible time to become tangible and visible on the page. So how has that, that ability to represent time that way been useful in your comics about society and politics? And we have another question about um, the, how the different forms of comics, cartoons, and illustrations um, about their ability to convey content and, and how maybe they're different than tr more traditional art forms like paintings or drawings. So um, I don't know if, if maybe some of you have thoughts on um, the first question about representing time and how that works in a political context. And um, if you had something maybe to say on the differences between things like comics, cartoons and illustrations versus more traditional art. Um, I could talk about the time thing a little bit. Um, I mean, I, I think every panel transition, so every two panels, uh, it's about time transitioning, but whether it's, uh, you know, moment to moment or a longer period of time, right? So that, that actually applies to narratives of all kinds. It doesn't apply to political cartoons uh, in particular. So whether or not you can use that um, ability of comics to tell time passing in many different ways, that's, I think, entirely up to the particular illustrator, right? So you can tell a very linear story that happens like beat by beat, a uh, person talking, you know, it came just like an interview, right? Uh, of a person on screen, in the case of panel to panel, or you can, you know, show time passing from 500 BC to 2000 years in the future, right? I think that's, uh, that, that's like I say, it's a comic narrative tool rather than it's something that applies to, to politics in, in particular. Uh, in terms of the differences between comics and other mediums, I and I think every medium has its own strengths and weaknesses, right? So I think uh, in that sense, comics for me is just one medium amongst many, right? Even though that's a, one thing that I enjoy practicing, that I enjoy reading myself, I think that uh, what, what we're trying to do essentially is to create narratives that can affect change in the world at some level. And to do that, you can't rely on any one medium, uh, not video, not articles or books by themselves. I think uh, it's a collective effort that you make. Um, and comics is one of the ways that can appeal to some people at some level. Uh, then in combination with other mediums, videos, uh, articles uh, together, I think that that's how change can or can, or, you know, hopefully does happen. Uh, yeah, I agree with Sunny in this, um, you know, because um, comics is just one form of medium and uh, illustration, yes, is another form of medium, but depending on the situation and how you use it, it like, you know, um, you sort of know that there are certain, like, it depends on what you want to do in terms of um, how you, how you intend to portray. So let's just say you, let's just say you have a lot of, um, um, you know, if you want to portray something quickly, you can just do it in a short comic. If you want to portray a long story, then, you know, you do a longer comic. Or if you want to do it in a single, like, you know, one one punch kind of thing, then sometimes you do an illustration, like, for example, Joyce work. Uh, so it's very situational. You can't say that, you know, this, oh, this perfect uh, medium to, do everything. It all has to marry within each other to get, uh, you know, to achieve maybe maximum effect. Who knows? 
Uh, yeah, uh, I guess for me, uh, the, I think that comics um, does help to kind of uh, maybe versus single frame media. I think it can bring about like contrasting ideas because maybe um, I think this idea of like, yeah, like the imaginative empathy is, is maybe, at least personally, the way I, I do the solution for my narratives is that maybe you put yourself in the, the, the shoes of like the outside. So usually in like comics or even film, you notice there's like a, there's a shot that like gives you the, the context, right? And then it kind of goes into character. I mean, this is a very like typical sub character and then like the character's inner mind. So it, it kind of, I think having the near time allows you to put yourselves in the shoes. Um, and then especially when you're trying to bring about a transformative idea, I think there's a little bit of that, you know, versus, I'm not saying that single images can't do that. They're very powerful images that can tell a story in one image, but um, let's say for comics, you wanna hook in the narrative, like hook in the reader and then you can kind of bring some sort of like elucidation at the end. Um, I think that's where comics comes in. And I think it also maybe can act as like, like a Trojan horse because people think that comics are for kids, right? So sure, like anyone can read it and then they read it and it's like, haha, now you're thinking what I want you to think. <laughs> no, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think either way I think, uh, and it's entertaining also, like I grew up on the diet of comics and that's how I found my way into the world uh, in terms of uh, written content and media. So. Uh, I, I think it, it's, it's just a powerful medium because it's so unassuming um, and they're fun to make. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we do have more questions in the chat, but I unfortunately I think we're out of time. Um, so thank you everyone, like all three of you for, for speaking and sharing your thoughts. Um, and thank you for everyone who tuned in. I'm really sorry that we couldn't get to everybody's questions, but I think we, we had, um, quite a lot of interesting things shared and, and a bit more context about what it's like to be making um, political art in, in Singapore and, you know, shedding some light about the things that you have to navigate as an artist. So, and uh, yeah, so thank you so much, everybody. Um, G, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Deborah, for moderating that really interesting uh, conversation with these fantastic artists, uh, Sunny, Joy and Shirin. Uh, as I was listening to you, I'm just filled with admiration for what you do every day because you really have to negotiate, don't you? Uh, not just with censorship, because that seems very crude, but with all kinds of factors, right? That you know will affect, you know, the reception of your art. Uh, as you negotiate those boundaries, you're also at the same time pushing the envelope. I think that was the phrase used by Joy. And uh, my admiration goes out to you uh, because it's not, cannot be an easy job uh, to negotiate and yet to push. And, you know, you also remind us in all your various ways, you know, about connections that, uh, you know, uh, comics can actually uh, perform for us. So, you know, Shireen talk about, you know, the connection uh, between people, you know, person to person by making, you know, uh, comics neutral or approachable. And uh, Joy talked about the connection uh, between the head and the heart, all right, which, you know, uh, visuals can actually do perhaps even better than words. And, you know, uh, Sunny talks about the connection of, you know, um, comics to tradition, the visual tradition, all right, reminding us that, you know, this is really the latest, only the latest iteration, isn't it, of, uh, of art, uh, a popular art with all that possibilities of reaching out to a mass audience. Uh, so thank you so much for that really fascinating conversation and uh, really appreciate uh, you giving of yourself, giving of your time and giving of uh, uh, your thoughts. Uh, so thank you everybody for actually joining us uh, tonight uh, for this uh, festival preview two of the 2020 Singapore Literature Festival in New York City. Uh, we hope that uh, all of you will join us for the uh, festival proper, which will take place on October 1st through the 3rd Thursday to Saturday. Uh, do sign up early for extras, such as interviews, excerpts, and updates. Uh, there is a sign up uh, link uh, in the chat. Now, if you like what we're doing for cultural exchange, freedom of expression, and equal rights, uh, please consider making a generous donation at Fractured Atlas, our fiscal sponsor. We rely on uh, individual champions like you to do the work that we do. So thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you to our speakers, to Deborah for moderating this conversation so capably, uh, capably. And I hope to see all of you again at the festival. Right, good night everyone. Bye for now. <laughs>